Good morning. Hi, everybody. It's so good to be here this morning. Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I think we've all been waiting for this moment for quite a while. Um, the holidays. The holidays are finally here and I have so much gratitude. I have gratitude for everybody who's going to be showing up here today on Instagram. I have gratitude for my family, of course, and really just gratitude for the collective uh, communities that we've all established through this really strange and bizarre time. You know, probably spending um, time with people that you might not have thought you'd be spending so much time with and what a beautiful thing it's turned out to be. So I am very excited. Uh, good morning, Jeremy. Oh, hello, good morning. Um, I am thrilled uh, that these banters have like kind of taken off so that we can really talk about the film that I've been working on for the last three years, Would You Hide Me? And to learn more about Would You Hide Me, please go to our website, wouldyouhideme.com, and you can see sample reels, you can see all of our 60 second docs all in one place, you can see them all here on um, Instagram as well as on Facebook and on YouTube, as a matter of fact. They're all under Beth Lane Film. And, um, but when you go to the website, it's got this really fancy button that says donate. So uh, we really need help getting over the hump so that we can finish production and hire a composer, hire our animators, hire our art designers, hire all the people that will bring us home and, and bring this incredible movie to Theaters? Homes? What's it going to be? Who knows? Um, anyway, this morning I am thrilled. Oh, great. I'm, I'm bringing Stephen Pressman in. Here he is. I'm so excited. Pressman is joining us this morning. He's my guest and I'm so excited um, for all of you to meet him. Hi! Hello, Beth. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? Uh, just fine. Good, good. You're getting ready Pleasure for to tomorrow, right? Oh, well, thank you for accepting my invitation to come on this morning so we can have our banter. Absolutely. <laughs> what are you doing for Thanksgiving tomorrow? Well, I've got a couple of kids who live uh, very close to me. So we're going to uh, sit outside on my back deck, Yes. Uh, be, be responsible. I also have an almost two-year-old granddaughter um, so uh, this will be a very, very special Thanksgiving. And we're all going to be very safe, sit outside, right. and uh, enjoy the holiday as, as best we can. Yes, for sure. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, it's an unusual year, and we all have to just do what we can to... This is, this is probably the smallest Thanksgiving that I think we've ever had, but that's at least we get to have it. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. And with a little bit of luck, we'll be able to get back to normal sometime next year, hopefully. I agree. I agree. So let's just like jump right into it. You have an amazing movie that has it has been released yet or not yet released? Uh, yes, it's been out. It's it started Holy out on Silence the film. Is the name of the movie, yeah. Uh, Holy Silence is the name of the film. It's a film about the Vatican and the Holocaust. Uh, it actually started out on the film festival circuit earlier in the year before things shut down. Uh, like like lots of other films that moved into the virtual world. Uh, but I'm also very proud of the fact that uh, it's been on showing up on PBS uh, all throughout November. And so it's, uh, it's, it's been having a nice run. Thanks. Sure. Good. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, I watched it last week and I was blown away by it. So congratulations. I hope that it has, you know, a really successful run um, and, and then some. But tell everybody... Uh, tell everybody how you came to the story and why you decided to make the movie. Yeah, um, you know, uh, first of all, a little bit of background about myself. I, I'm a, um, I, I didn't start out as a filmmaker earlier on in my career. I, I spent many, many years as an old fashioned print journalist. I was a, both a reporter uh, and then an editor at a bunch of different publications, starting out in Los Angeles, uh, where I grew up. Uh, and then I lived in Washington, D.C., and I've been in San Francisco for many years. So after, after several decades uh, as, a, as a journalist, um, about 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to make my first documentary film. Uh, this was another Holocaust-related film called uh, 50 Children, uh, The Rescue Mission of Mr. and Mrs. Krause. And what was uh, fun about you sending me the link to that one as well is I started to watch it and I said, oh, wait, 
I've seen this movie. Of course I've seen this movie, you know, where it's, I mean, it's part of my research as I'm working on my film. And um, that, that film is equally extraordinary. Well, and, and uh, the connection to the new film is, uh, I had an opportunity to make that, that earlier film, Beth, 50 Children, which was uh, a story that had never been told before about a Philadelphia couple, Gilbert and Eleanor Krauss, who went into Nazi Germany in the spring of 1939 and brought back a group of 50 children from Vienna. Um, I, again, I had never made a film before, but the reason I was able to tell that never before told story is that uh, my, um, my late wife, uh, Liz Purley, um, was the granddaughter of Gil and Eleanor Krauss. And Liz had al always known what her grandparents had done but nobody outside of the family had ever kn known anything at all about this story. So I made the decision with a little bit of chutzpah involved uh, that I would try to turn it into a documentary film. Uh, and I spent a couple of years doing that. And then very fortunately, the film got picked up by uh, HBO. Uh, and suddenly I was a filmmaker. Um, <laughs> and, um, I'll be very honest with you, Beth, after I made that first film, and this is the connection to the new one, I, to be honest, and I know we talked about this when we, when we spoke earlier, I, I kind of made a vow to myself that I was absolutely not going to make another Holocaust film. <laughs> you know, I had spent a couple of years living in that world. As, as you know, it's a dark place to go. Very important to tell these stories. But I thought, okay, I've made my Holocaust film. Maybe I'll find something else to do. But after I had finished that first film, I had gotten to know some uh, uh, people who work at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, and they had been doing uh, some ongoing work with the Vatican, mostly around getting access to uh, archives and records that have been kept at the Vatican for many, many years about the Holocaust and what the Vatican was doing and not doing. And that began to sort of mull around in my mind. Maybe there was a film that might focus on that, uh, that period of history. Um, and so suddenly, despite that promise I had made to myself, I was, I was engaged and, 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 and I started working on this new film that turned into a Holy Silence, uh, which well, is Well, film so your that... background as a journalist, I'm sure when you found out that there was this story and, and the museum was working with the Vatican, it just had to whet your appetite as an investigative journalist. I mean, is that what you consider? You, in terms of journalism, that's what you are, right? Yes, exactly. And, and you're right. There, there's, there's a definite connection between that kind of, uh, that kind of journalism and, and some of the skills, I suppose, that, that we have as journalists. Uh, the connection between that and say documentary filmmaking. Um, and for, for me, it turned out to not be that difficult of a transition to, to, to move from the world of journalism into filmmaking. And, uh, you know, I've loved every step of it. Oh, that's so wonderful. I mean, there's no question that with Holy Silence, you have, uh, I, I, to me, what I think is so special and unique about the film, in addition to the story, the story is always gonna be front and center, but you've made archival material come to life. I mean, you have taken your investigative journalism skills, you've like put them front and center, and you have pulled things out that no one, I mean, let's just talk about that one character who had footage when he was a child and you got your hands on that footage. How, how did that even happen? How did you meet him and how did you get that footage? And it was just extraordinary. He just happened to have a camera and he took pictures. Um, uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember the specific... It, uh, uh, gosh, okay, so it was one of the characters in your film, he was, he was older, talking about when he was really young, and then he had a camera. Oh, oh of course, Ab absolutely. I, I was having a senior moment there, Beth. Barclay Titman, yeah, that's, he's a wonderful character. So here's the story. Uh, there, was a, there was a gentleman named Harold Titman, who was, during... During, during the war, uh, Harold Tittman was a career foreign service officer in the U.S. Foreign Service. And when the war broke out, he uh, had been working at the U.S. Embassy in Rome. And he, like uh, others, moved into the Vatican. Well, Harold and his wife had two young boys. 
uh, two sons named Barclay and, and, uh, uh, and Harold Titman Jr. Um, and, um, and, and in the course of doing my research for the film, I, I knew about the Harold Titman character and I knew that I wanted him to be part of the film. I mean, he died years and years and years ago. And I did a little bit of journalistic digging and I discovered that his son, Barclay, uh, who's now was well into his 80s, right. was alive, alive and kicking and living in Cambridge, Massachusetts with his wife and he had his own family. And I got in touch with him and I explained what I was doing with the film and that I wanted to sort of focus on what his father was doing at the Vatican during the time. And Barclay and his wife very, very graciously invited me to their home in Cambridge. We filmed an interview with him and then he went into his study at his home and pulled out uh, these photo albums that were filled with photos taken of the time and, and, and including the fact that he and his brother had been taking photos themselves while they were living inside the Vatican. So suddenly I had access to photographs that nobody had ever seen I, you know, outside of Barclay's family. I saw the movie and now you're talking about it again and I literally am getting goosebumps on my kneecaps again because looking at those photos and so so much of the other archival footage that you secured, I, you know, for those of us that are like kind of in this research, we see a lot. You have stuff that none of us have ever seen. Yeah. I mean, it's really extraordinary. Well, you know, to me, Beth, that, and, and, and I know you know this, uh, given your own uh, work on, on your film project, for me at least, uh, so much of the fun is doing that kind of research. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, uh, obviously film being, being the visual medium that it is, um, you know, it's all about finding the interesting visuals. Yes. Um, and I have, I have to say, I think that is a particular challenge. And I know you're, you're facing this as well. That's a particular challenge when it comes to Holocaust related films, because yes. I think we all, both as filmmakers, but also as people who have been watching Holocaust films uh, for a long time, we're all sort of accustomed to seeing some of those images that we've seen over and over and over again. Uh, and again, those are, those are important images. We have to remember all of, all of that. But the, the challenge from a filmmaking point of view, I think, is to find sort of new ways to present uh, these stories about the Holocaust and uh, and I was you know I was fortunate in a way to be able to find archival materials, both some footage and some still photographs, some documents, and so forth that probably aren't quite as familiar to audiences uh, right. as uh, as they as, as as other materials might be. Sure. Um, so what and, do you yeah, think I, for you when you decided? Okay, so you're you're working with, with the Holocaust Museum, you. Your, your appetite gets whetted for the subject matter, but still, especially with documentary film, like you just, when you get in bed with a film, you're in it, that's it. That's all you're doing. And you're in it for a long time, somewhere, you know, I don't know, how long did it take you to make uh, Holy Silence? Uh, a couple of years. Yeah, a couple of years. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm on year three of Will You Hide Me? And um, even though it's probably been in my, in my brain for decades, sure. you know, since it's my family's story, but, um, so, but what do you think is the reason why you, you, Stephen, really had to tell this story and why did you have to tell it now? Well, um, you know, again, I, I, I was, uh, part of it was because I had my own sort of lack of awareness of this particular aspect of the story, uh, meaning what the Vatican was doing and not doing. Look, I grew up as a, as a Jewish kid uh, in LA, in the San Fernando Valley, um, I, I'm, sh I'm sure there were neighbors to my left and right who were Catholics, but that's not the world I grew up in. So, so I grew up in an in a era where I personally had like no knowledge at all of what was going on um, within the Catholic Church during this dark period of history. And so fast forward all these years later to when I'm, uh, I'm an adult, I'm learning more, I've become a filmmaker, and I realize that uh, even though the overall topic of the Vatican and the Holocaust, look, I, I now have a bookshelf filled with books on this topic. So I'm, I'm late to the party. There, there are lots of people 
several of whom I interviewed who are in the film, who have been devoted, who have been devoting their scholarly careers for years to this topic. But from a filmmaking point of view, it was something that I, that I, I don't think there was all that much material about. So right. the, more, the more I became curious about my own lack of knowledge, I realized there was an opportunity to maybe sort of educate some others a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, the, the, other, um, the other thing I really wanted to do with the film uh, is also to um, tell the story of some American officials, uh, and those include both priests and politicians and diplomats and others, and what they were trying to do at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I was looking at this sort of through two different lenses. Uh, much of the film focuses on two different popes and what they were doing, Pope Pius XI and Pius XII. But I also was trying to make a film that would tell audiences a little bit about what was happening in the United States during this time as well. Uh, and, and for me, uh, I've always been fascinated and by U.S. history, by, by our own history as a country. And that's, that's the kind of perspective I was hoping to bring to the film. Sure, sure. And you did. I mean, you brought it so successfully. You know, the film, of course, I shouldn't say of course, but you're, you finished the film of, with Elie Wiesel's most famous quote, I think, that neutrality only helps the oppressor, not the oppressed. And, um, and I agree with that. Uh, oops, here we my screen went a little black there. Um, and so I want to ask you about your feelings about putting that statement out today in 2020 and, sure. and the parallels to what's going on in the, in the world today? It's a great question, Beth. And, and obviously, um, obviously there are historical parallels. The, uh, look, there's a, reason, uh, there's a reason in addition to closing the film with the Elie Wiesel quote about how silence always helps the oppressors, never the oppressed. Uh, that's the reason why the film is called Holy Silence. Uh, it's all about uh, looking at this question of what it means to stay silent in the face of horrible things going on in the world around us. Uh, that is something that is as true today as it was during the Holocaust. It's it, the, the notion of remaining silent um, is is something that runs through history. You know, I, I knew I was never going to make that direct connection in the film uh, and without getting too partisan in our discussion here, I have to say, I have to say that what really struck me, and I wasn't even aware of this when I was making the film, um, but there's a parallel actually to our incoming president, Joe Biden. Joe Biden always tells the story of, and he, he's often told the story, of what ultimately prompted him to run for president uh, yeah. this year. And mm -hmm. it was Charlottesville in 2017. And, um, and, and he's got this very dramatic speech where he says it was this notion of people remaining silent uh, during, uh, during what happened in Charlottesville with the neo-Nazis and the white supremacists mm -hmm. that, um, uh, that, that motivated him to stand up and run for president. And, and I, th that, that, that notion of silence just struck me because I realized that the same issues that are addressed in my film about, in this case, the silence of the Pope during the Holocaust continues to resonate to this day. Um, look, it's, it's easy for a lot of us to say, oh, we would definitely stand up in the face of all this. Who knows if we would do that or not? Uh, you know, I've... I've uh, I, I've never been confronted with that wrenching decision. Do I stand up and speak out? Um, you know, I hide behind a camera when I make these films. But I think these are universal questions that are as relevant today uh, as they were 70, 80 years ago uh, during the Holocaust. Absolutely. And I was really encouraged this morning to read uh, in my, I get my CNN, you know, news feed and stuff that, um, that it what was his name Tolliver, uh, the the um, the basketball player uh, was at the Vatican and yes. some other basketball players too. But they're talking to the Pope about racism. They're talking Absolutely. to the Pope about systemic 
racism. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And, yeah, and as a matter of fact, the Pope, I even wrote this down. Hang on, let me find this. The Pope said um, that looking at the problems in society, and especially those of social justice, sport can be a good means of resolving them. And then he goes on to say, we should always remember this because your message is the, is the goodwill of sports, but also working together as a team, the work as a community, and may this be the seed of beauty and of a shared development towards justice. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, yay to the Grizzlies. We're going to the Vatican. It's, uh, uh, absolutely. But, but also yay to Pope Francis for, uh, for, for, uh, for inviting them. You know, I mean, look. Yes. Uh, again, I, I'm not a Catholic. Uh, I, I'm not immersed in that world, but uh, I know enough to be able to say that uh, Pope Francis really on so many issues uh, stands in stark contrast to many of his predecessors. Yes. And unfortunately, including the one who's at the focus of my film, uh, Pope Pius XII. And, right. and, and indeed, my film closes uh, with uh, footage of Pope Francis walking into Auschwitz uh, four or five years ago when he, when he visited there. Now, Pope Francis was not the first Pope to go to Auschwitz. A couple of his predecessors, uh, John Paul II uh, went uh, as well. There, there were others who, who did courageously go to Auschwitz. Um, but in a film that uh, talks about the silence of the Pope, the silence <laughs> of the Vatican during the Holocaust, uh, it says something about, I think, where, we, where we've come, and in particular, where the Catholic Church has come, yes. um, to see a, a pope walk, walking into the gates of Auschwitz, uh, lamenting what happened to the six million Jews uh, during, during the Holocaust. And again, again, I think that sends a very powerful message uh, that, uh, that tells us how far we've come uh, in terms of at least that aspect of the story of the Holocaust. For sure, particularly because you make it clear in the film that the, the Vatican still had not denounced anti-Semitism until about 1965. That's correct. And, yeah. um, and so they have come a long way since 1965, particularly it seems in the last 15 years or so. Um, there, again, I'm, I'm Jewish, I don't, I'm not immersed in the Catholic world, uh, but just you know the little things that I've, I've been reading and learning about, as we all do, uh, it's been a marked change and and a welcome overdue, long overdue change for sure. For sure. It, it, it sure has. And, and the other thing that I think is worth keeping in mind, uh, and this was a little bit of a coincidence in terms of the timing of my film, but it's only this past March um, that the Vatican has finally released the long secret archives right. yeah, I per, want to talk pertain, about that. Per, yes. pertaining to Pope Pius XII. Um, so, now, yeah, when I was making... Yeah, I, I really what, want to hear, like, I know that you were probably, you already, you were finished filming, filming when that, so it happened in March of 2020 that those files were finally released. Correct. And about, you know, and it's, what is it? How many pages did you, did you say there are in those files? Uh, there, there's something like 16 million pages yeah. of documents. Yeah. Right, so it's going to take them forever. It's going to take them a long time. But it's, you must, even though you're finished with the film, you've got to be dying to know what's in those papers. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, the, only, the only sort of anxious moment I had is uh, uh, a year earlier, in March of 2019, uh, my film editor and I were working on the film, and we're, we were getting close to finishing the film, or or getting pretty close to wrapping up our editing on the film. And uh, that's when Pope Francis, and I'll never forget this, I wake up to the news that Pope Francis has announced that a year later, in March of this year, those archives are gonna be open. Yes. And I, I went into a panic because I knew that my film was going to come out uh, right before those archives were gonna be released. And so for the next 24 hours, I called all of the people I had interviewed for the film. These were the people who were the experts. These were the people who mm -hmm. themselves were gonna be digging through those archives. And I said, is my film going to be out of date even before it's oh, finished? My, yeah. Oh, that's brutal. That's brutal. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Welcome to documentary filmmaking. <laughs> luckily, luckily, they all sort of talked me, talked me off the ledge and said, look, Steve, uh, 
it really is going to take us years to go through those millions and millions of pages of documents. So uh, we're, we're pretty sure your film's going to be just fine for, for the foreseeable future. Absolutely. No, I think it stands the test of time. You know, and I think that um, just in this last year, some of the films that have come out that are so interesting to me, I'd love to know which films have been inspiring you, but watching your film, watching our friend Stephen Edwards' film, Syndrome K, um, which is, uh, it's released in Europe, but it hasn't been released here in the, in the U.S. yet. But even last year, Robert Bahar's film, uh, The Silence of Others, which is about, you know, Franco's 40-year di dictatorship in Spain. I mean, that was a, a really, really inspiring film. What's, what's like on your hot list of things that have been inspiring? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, um, I actually don't tend to watch a whole lot of Holocaust-related films. Right. Um, and, um, and in part, I think I do that uh, because I don't want to be sort of uh, influenced either, either subtly or directly or subliminally by what other filmmakers are doing with similar topics. Um, I mean, that may be sort of, you know, putting blinders on. Um, but look, I mean, I, I love watching all kinds of documentaries, uh, both in terms of the stories they tell, but also quite honestly, I'm always looking for little tips, little techniques, and, you know, because um, I'm always curious to know how other documentary filmmakers are telling their stories. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the other night I was, um, th there's, this, there's this new documentary about John Belushi that just premiered on, on oh. Showtime. It's a terrific documentary, obviously got nothing to do with the Holocaust, yeah. but, but mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's, it's a wonderful film. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why I really was fascinated by it is there's some very interesting use of, and we talked about this earlier, uh, there's some interesting use of animation, uh, and which I know you and uh, lots of other filmmakers have been playing around with. And so when I, when I look at documentaries these days, uh, in addition to focusing on the story, I'm looking for little tips and tricks to see, you know, what I might be able to pick up on um, as, as a way of, um, you know, adding a little more drama and tension to, to, oh. the, films that, to the films that we're making. It's, oh. it's, it's fun. For sure. Well, we're just going to wrap up here because um, it's been 30 minutes already. I don't know how wow. I go fast. It goes by quickly, I'm Beth. I'm so thrilled that you joined us today. Quickly, what's next? Like, what's next for you? Well, uh, I am not making another Holocaust film, um, <laughs> but I am uh, in production on a, it, it's a great story. It's a, it's a little known story uh, that focuses on Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello, outside oh. of Charlottesville, Virginia, mm -hmm. and the very little known story of a Jewish family that, uh, that owned and saved from ruin Thomas Jefferson's home at Monticello. So um, it's, it's a great story. I'm very excited about that film. Sure, what's and, the working uh, title for it? Uh, the working title is The Jews of Monticello. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> we'll, we'll, see, we'll, see if, we'll see if that one sticks. You know, you got to right, come up with right. a working title. The but uh, I'm very excited. It's, it's, it's a terrific story, and I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Sure, sure. Well, it's been so nice getting to know you and catching up with you for everybody. Stephen's film is Holy Silence. And Stephen, tell everybody how they can see it. Uh, it's on PBS uh, for the rest of November. You can stream it on pbs.org. Uh, and uh, it's also, also available on Amazon Prime through the PBS Documentary Channel. Nice, nice. Well, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Morning. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody else that's been watching. Thanks for tuning in. And we will see you. We're, we're skipping Banter with Beth this sun Sunday because of the holiday and I want to hang out with my kids. But we'll be back next Wednesday with another journalist, Jessica Goldstein, who has a really interesting story about uh, what she found in her attic. So thanks, Stephen. I really appreciate Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Take and care, Beth. And happy Thanksgiving. Take care, everybody. You too. Okay. Bye now. Bye. Yeah.